All right, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in Singapore. And I want to also use an example of some data that comes from the United States that can maybe illustrate what the potential is for longevity interventions. Uh, and so first I wanna uh, reiterate some of the points that were already made. Uh, this is a very old slide. Uh, what it, what it uh, indicates though is that the world is radically changing. Uh, when I was born in 1967, there were about three times as many people under the age of five as over the age of 65. And by 2050, and I still plan to be here in 2050, <laughs> there'll be about three times as many people over the age of 65 as under the age of five. So the demography of the world is really rapidly changed. You know that in China, it's one of the fastest changing demographies, um, but it's happening all over the world. And there are several reasons for that. Um, you'll note on this slide that the rate of change is also altering. So when France and Sweden went from 7 to 14% of the population over 65, that took almost 100 years. So the society had time to adapt to that uh, and adjust. But for countries like China, uh, Korea, many, many Asian countries, and also some South American countries, that transition is happening extremely rapidly. Wow, that slide's changing on its own. Let's hope it doesn't keep doing that. It's also worth pointing out that life expectancy has goes up at different rates in different countries, and that's a reflection of government policy and social policy. Uh, on the, uh, let me get my pointer here, because it's advancing slides whether I want it to or not. Hold on a second. I'll come back, just one second here. Something's adjusted, okay. So if you look at uh, these, these are all European countries, Western European countries have gone steadily up in life expectancy. Uh, many of the Eastern European countries were stagnant for a while and then started going up at about the same rate as the Western European countries. This last little blip here is effects of COVID. And this data ends in 2020, so there'll be more effect of that. Uh, but if you look over here, we're looking at Russia, US, and China. Uh, and the rapid increase in life expectancy in China is very impressive. Um, but you also note that the United States has gone up much more slowly than many of these European countries. In fact, uh, the, the scale here is it goes to, uh, uh, higher on this graph. So the, the life expectancy has gone up much higher in European countries than the US. And so bad healthcare policy, bad social policies have put a limit, bad lifestyle have put a limit on uh, the gains in life expectancy in the US. So policies matter, lifestyle matters. These things are important when you're thinking about a national policy to keep people healthy. Uh, Singapore, uh, is uh, going to have one in four people over the age of 65 uh, in by 2030, very rapidly. Uh, and then uh, the other thing in Singapore is that reproductive rates are extremely low. So we're, uh, couples are having 1.1 children per couple, uh, and that means there's a declining old age support rate ratio. So there will only be two people working for every retired person in less than 10 years. So the government has recognized this as a major problem. Uh, there's not enough people working. Uh, we can't just build nursing homes for all of the older people. That's very expensive, and it's also probably not giving them the quality of life they deserve. Um, and so we have to have a different strategy to how to keep Singaporeans healthy. And it, the cost, the economics is very clear. If you look on the right here, this is the cost per person of someone over 65 by number of chronic illnesses. So if they have no chronic illnesses, their costs are extremely low. That's about 2,000 US dollars and about the same as someone under the age of 65. Uh, but once you get to one chronic disease and two or more, the costs skyrocket. So it's pretty clear that we need to be keeping people in this category for as long as possible. And much of the medicine has been focused around uh, one disease at a time. Uh, we don't do that much health care. We do a lot of sick care. Uh, so if you get heart disease, you see a specific doctor and get treated for heart disease. If you get Alzheimer's disease, you see a different doctor. 
Um, and what's clear in recent years is that these are not different diseases. These are connected diseases. In fact, all of them are connected by one common risk factor, and that's aging. Of course, aging is not the only thing that causes these diseases, but it's the biggest risk factor. And so this leads to a very simple point is that why do we spend all the money treating these diseases? Of course, we want to treat disease. Don't get me wrong. I want to be treated when I get sick. And very little of the money trying to slow aging, which will be protective against all the diseases simultaneously or many of them. And so that's really been the strategy of my research for a long time. And when I came to Singapore, it was to focus on more human studies. I should point out that COVID is on everybody's mind, but it doesn't change the equation I just told you. Uh, the number one risk factor for mortality uh, for COVID-19, is this is early data from Italy and China, is being over the age of 70, um, independently of disease. So when you get older, you, your resilience drops, your ability to respond to viral in infection drops, you don't recover as fast, and, and you're more likely to die. And this is not particularly surprising because we knew that data from influenza already, and so it's a very similar result. So really, it's not just about aging driving disease. Yes, aging does drive disease. It also drives functional decline, and it drives the response to acute infectious disease. So. Uh, that makes it even more prominent that we, are, that we need to do something about the aging process. And so our strategy is relatively simple to understand. If you imagine this is someone who's born, they stay healthy for a very long time, uh, and their body can cope with uh, the changes that are happening and keep them functioning, but then that starts to break down and they start getting sick. That's when the medical care happens. Uh, and we spend a lot of money at that point onward trying to treat people for disease. Of course, it helps people live longer uh, managing disease, uh, but they still get multiple conditions and they die at some point. What we're saying is that really uh, healthy longevity should be a life course approach. And throughout adulthood, we should be looking at interventions that while people are still in the green, to keep them in the green healthy zone longer. If this happens, what we suspect will happen is life lifespan will go up, but more importantly, health span will go up more rapidly than lifespan. And that's the economic victory we're looking for and the quality of life victory. So our approach is not to target frail populations or cachexic populations or people with multimorbidity. Our approach is to target middle-aged people at risk of disease to try to slow or reverse aspects of the aging process and keep them healthy. And I think this comes back to a point. Um, the Hippocratic Oath is something everybody reads when they go to medical school. It's plastered all over the medical school in the U.S. Uh, and it's actually quite an interesting and, and, and uh, uh, document that's way ahead of its time. But it's been interpreted to be first do no harm uh, is one of the key features of it, meaning if someone that you don't want to harm anybody. And that gets extended to do, doing nothing for people while they're still healthy. And I want to make the case that that's, doing nothing can be harming people. If we're not trying to optimize someone's health throughout their life, uh, then we're harming them. We're not giving them the information and potentially the supplements and drugs they need to stay healthy and to stay functional. And so we should stop interpreting this to be don't do anything unless somebody's sick. I think that's not where healthcare needs to go. So there's been a lot of research on aging, uh, and there have been hallmarks and path and pillars of aging reported in the journals about 10 years ago. Uh, these are being updated continually now. Uh, I think that I could talk about each of these pathways, but I think it's that's not the most important thing about today's lecture. Um, what I'd rather focus on is the connectivity between these different pathways. So yes, when you get older, your metabolism often gets altered, your ability to adapt to stress declines, you have more inflammation and damage, there's changes in epigenetic uh, uh, in, information in, in your cells, your stem cells don't function as well. But in reality, I think of aging a bit differently. I think of it as a homeostatic network that keeps you healthy. It responds to the signaling pathways that respond to damage in your body and compensate for that. So as you're getting older, 
Yes, you can measure aging. I'm 55. I don't run as fast. I don't jump as high. I don't, probably don't think as quickly as I did when I was younger. Uh, but your body's still functioning. It's still compensating, and you're not sick, and you can still go through life normally. But when this pathway, this network breaks down, that's when you can't respond correctly anymore, and you start getting chronic diseases and rapid functional decline. And so really the interventions that, that extend lifespan so far, mostly from data from animal models, they can be read out as improvements in all of these pillars of aging. Because uh, the, what they're really doing is targeting nodes in the network that's keeping the network functioning longer. At least that's the way I think about it. Happy to talk more in questions. Uh, and there are lots of interventions out there now that uh, may extend lifespan. Uh, the one in the dark red circle here would be lifestyle interventions. The reviewer put people in this review said fully researched. That's an exaggeration. But I think it's fair to say we know that sustainable exercise, a healthy diet, uh, sleep, uh, and uh, managing stress levels are likely to increase your health span, keep you healthy longer. Particularly for exercise, we have wonderful data on that. Uh, there is sort of a middle circle here which are drugs and small molecules. And these are being rapidly developed uh, both in the academic uh, sector and in the private sector right now. And I'm gonna talk about one example of that today. And then there are more radical interventions, stem cell therapies, gene therapy, organ replacement, and a variety of other things that may ultimately, rejuvenation, that may ultimately have an even bigger impact on health span and lifespan, but are also further from being in the clinic at this point. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that today. I can answer questions if you like. So if you go to the drug age database, there are a thousand molecules that are reported in that database, uh, about 110 that have been tested for aging in mice. Uh, so there's no shortage of candidates uh, to, to extend health span and lifespan from animal models. The question really for us is how do we extend this to human studies? How do we validate what works in humans and what doesn't? So these are things that I work on right now in my lab on the left. I'm just gonna talk about alpha ketoglutarate today, but I wanna point out that we see beneficial effects at least in animal aging, mice and killifish for gemfibrozil, urolithin. Uh, it's been reported previously for rapamycin and spermidine, and we can confirm that, vitamin A, and also it's been reported by the ITP program for glycine, and we see that glycine has beneficial effects as well. So the good news is, at least as we're trying to validate many of these interventions, uh, we can see that a lot of them actually work in our hands. So there's at least, at least a second, if not more labs now that have been able to see this. And we use this as a gatekeeper approach before we go into human studies because we want to understand the molecule better. And one way to do that is to see that it validates in animal models. So I'm gonna talk about AKG today, just because we have the most human data on that. Uh, this was a collaboration with Ponce de Leon Health uh, back when I was at the Buck Institute, and also a collaboration with Gordon Lithgow, who did a lot of worm aging and uh, screening. Um, what I'm a, well, the goal was to look for combinations of natural products that have additive effects on lifespan and health span. And um, the, uh, um, point here is that uh, we found a number of these combinations, and the human data I show you is going to be with combinations I'll tell you about, but the animal data is just with, that I'm showing you is just with AKG. Uh, so we used a, a calcium AKG, gave it to animals at 18 months, followed their survival, uh, and also looked at their frailty. There's a very good frailty assay in mice now that corresponds to human frailty. We looked at a number of aging parameters as well, including stem cell function and immune function. And the longevity effects of AKG, and we've repeated this, we're on our fifth repeat, fifth iteration now, uh, are not hugely impressive, although there is an effect. You see an extension of female lifespan. You see a trend toward extension in males. Um, and uh, that trend is generally present in, in all of our repeats, uh, so there's very consistent data. The bigger effect, though, is on frailty, uh, and um, what we saw is a dramatic reduction in frailty in these animals. So if you look at these dots, I'm just going to go through this quickly, 
as the the higher the, the each one is a single animal at a given month of age and the higher the score the higher the frailty in the animal and so the frailty goes up more rapidly in the control animals than the akg treated animals and in fact there's a 50 percent reduction in frailty with only a 10 percent extension in lifespan so our argument is we're compressing morbidity in these animals uh, which is a i think a, a great strategy to try to achieve in humans now, AKG is a TCA cycle component. Uh, it's right here, alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, and it's involved in energy production, but also crosstalk between amino acid catabolism and carbohydrate metabolism. And actually, AKG participates in about 700 reactions in the cell. It goes down with age, and supplementing it back up is good. Trying to figure out which of those reactions are most important and why AKG is beneficial has been an interesting challenge <laughs> that we're still battling. Uh, it has many things that could be linked to aging in addition to its role in energy. It also reduces oxidative stress. It is a cofactor for uh, DNA demethylasis, so it affects uh, DNA methylation. Uh, it affects uh, hypoxia signaling, which has been linked to longevity and many other things. We've been able to show it improves adult stem cell function, alters metabolism, and now we're really excited about the microbiome data that we have. We're starting to understand that. And we think some of it is pointing to the fact that it may be improving barrier function and uh, um, mucosal uh, 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 density within the colon with aging. It reduces inflammation, but I, I wanna show you the human data. So there were two studies that have been done now. The first one was published. Uh, this Both of these were sponsored by the company. Uh, the first one was just people using the product Rejuvent, which is what the company produced. So Rejuvent is uh, alpha-ketoglutarate gram a day um, plus low-dose vitamin A if you're a man and low-dose vitamin D if you're a woman. And this is what we did is just took users of the product who were willing to take a relatively simple DNA methylation aging test as a biomarker. And I'm gonna talk about these biomarkers. Um, and they took it at baseline an average of seven months later, and then we measured their age by DNA methylation. So the other, you know, interventions are one of the major uh, advancements in the aging field. But another one is biomarkers of aging. and. These have uh, come from all kinds of data sets. You can get them from blood chemistry data. You can get them from accelerometry data. You can get them from transcriptomic data. The most commonly used ones are from DNA methylation data or epigenetic data. Uh, and it's pretty simple here. You uh, use uh, either machine learning or neural networking or a range of other AI techniques uh, to try to take a person's data in a large data set and uh, determine either their biologic age or their uh, likelihood of getting disease over a period of time. Uh, so you might have an individual that's 50 years old chronologically, uh, but also 50 years old biologically. We know, however, that some people are aging well and other people are not aging well. And that's what these clocks attempt to measure. So someone might be chronologically 50, but biologically 45, or chronologically 50, but biologically 60. And, and that's where we're, uh, those are the things we're starting to use as endpoints now to see if interventions work or not. And so this was the data from the seven month study. Uh, this is chronologic age minus biologic age. So if it goes up, that means people are getting biologically younger, at least by this DNA methylation clock. And what you see is of the 42 users, most of the points go up. The lines connect them from baseline and follow up. Uh, so there's about a seven year reduction in biologic age uh, with seven months of treatment. Now, this is not a placebo controlled study. And so there are a number of limitations to what we can say about this. And I do believe there is a placebo effect in this space. I think if people believe they're younger, they probably are a little bit younger. Uh, so seven years is a big response. Uh, and uh, it, from this study, we can't determine ex de uh, with the accuracy how much of it is the effect of the supplement and how much is the placebo effect. There are two things that are interesting out of this, though. Uh, we could predict the, the amount of response of an individual by two parameters. One is chronologic age. The people that were chronologically older responded more, uh, which I was a little bit uh, surprising to me. I didn't necessarily expect that to happen, but it's what we saw. The other one is if you're biologically older, 
than your chronologic age at start, you responded more. So in other words, the people that are aging very well have a very small response, and the people that are aging normally or not so well have a bigger response. And keep that in mind as we go to the next study. So this one is placebo controlled. It was done at Indiana University. We're doing the data analysis for it, and we're going to publish that soon. In this case, we use two different biologic age clocks, uh, and it was a six-month, uh, nine-month intervention and also a crossover. It's a more of a complicated design. I just want to show you uh, people that were on the product for six months um, just to give you a a hint of what's going on. We also used a Morgan Levine's phenoage blood clock for this one. So these are blood parameters that are not DNA methylation. And that may be relevant since AKG is a substrate for the demethylase. You could argue that it's having a direct effect on methylation uh, and that's skewing the data in some way. But here we're using blood analysis to, to determine biologic age. Uh, and those are the weights of the different parameters. This clock is nice because you can collect this data quite easily in clinical data. So that's one of the reasons we like it. And here was the results. Now, what the interesting thing about this is that we chose people for this study that were 45 to 65 and had no disease uh, in Indiana. And it turns out that this is their, on the bottom axis, this is their baseline chronologic age at the beginning of the study. So if you take people in late middle age that have no disease, you're selecting for a very narrow component of the population. You're selecting for the healthiest people. And then when you look at their biologic age by this clock, they're about five to 10 years younger on average uh, than their chronologic age. This was unfortunate for us because we didn't have the data from the other study at the time. But what that showed us, as I said, is that the people that don't respond very well or the people that are five years or 10 years younger than their chronologic age, the people that do respond are the ones who are aging normally or not aging well. Uh, so this is the number of years adjusted per three months per visit. So every three months, it goes down by this amount. If you're five years or more younger to start with, you have no effect. Almost everyone that's five years younger through normal to not aging well have a large response. Uh, and so we can predict about 57% of the effect just by their biologic age at baseline. And this was gender independent. So we think this study is showing exactly the same thing the last one did, uh, is that if you're, not, if you're normally aging or not aging well, you respond to the supplement. If you're aging already extremely well, you may be up against the limit and can't get much better. Now, we don't know if other supplements or interventions are gonna show this effect or not. Uh, there's data that's beginning to accumulate, but it's still sparse in terms of human aging data. Uh, we also saw drops in uh, cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, and some in metabolic improvements associated with AKG, and we'll be publishing this data. So I'm going to come back now to NUS and how we're approaching the problem. Uh, we've created pretty much a full pipeline now. We have about 35 faculty working in our programs to try to understand aging and age-related disease. Uh, this includes preclinical research, um, importantly, translational research, clinical research. And so our first clinical studies are going now uh, with interventions. We've already uh, nearly completed a number of cross-sectional and studies, and we're already involved in a number of longitudinal studies. Um, and we're also trying to do a lot of education to drive longevity science. Now, I want to point out that we're trying to take an agnostic approach here. We have resources to, resources to look at five to 10 interventions, uh, and we are very open-minded about what those could be. Uh, so if you have ideas for things you might affect human aging or you'd like to do preclinical testing first, um, we have a whole range of species we can do that in, and we're happy to work together collaboratively. Uh, we're working with three or four companies uh, that are testing different interventions or diagnostics right now. And the key thing is to get human. As I said, we have to move this field more into the human realm. It's happening now in, in different places in the world, and I think that's an exciting step for aging research. Uh, we're actively doing all kinds of things on the preclinical side, yeast, worms, and flies for rapidly aging organisms that are cheap. Uh, killifish, uh, we have a number of models in killifish now, and we can show that a number of the interventions that haven't yet been tested do actually slow aging in killifish 
um, stem cell models. Uh, a lot of mice, uh, we do uh, four or five interventions every six months. And uh, we have a lot of bioinformatics. We have a team now of AI people that are developing their own clocks, trying to sing make them Singapore friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things we're doing is developing measures for uh, different hallmarks of aging and lining that up to systemic measures of aging to try to see which hallmarks contribute to which systemic markers in what way. We've changed our animal approach now. We're not doing full lifespan studies. We start at 18 months and do six to nine month interventions and then use frailty and biologic aging in mice as our endpoints. And the reason for that is that that more closely links the mouse studies to the human studies. Our real goal here is to understand what's gonna work in humans. And we think by aligning the two types of studies, we can do things much more quickly and much more iteratively to understand. Um, so uh, the mouse studies can go more rapidly. Uh, I think in humans, the most important thing right now is to validate. We, I'm working closely with Andrea Meyer. You saw her in the video. Uh, and uh, she has a lot of exp expertise in clinical gerontology, uh, and we want to see what's working in human populations. I think the next step is to figure out how to optimize and personalize interventions in humans, because we know not everything is going to work in all people. In fact, I don't think anything is going to work in every person, uh, and it's going to be based on genetics and lifestyle, but we really don't have a lot of data on how to link up specific interventions to specific aging pathways. And, and parameters of aging in individuals. So that's a thing we're beginning to focus on. And what we're doing on the academic side is we want it to be scalable. So relatively low cost interventions, low cost diagnostics of biologic aging, things we can move into the community and potentially the whole population in Singapore. We're happy to work on more exotic interventions as well with companies. Uh, in partnership so that we can understand how they work as well. But uh, from government resources, we're really keeping economics in mind. So we take healthy or early pre-diseased people, uh, measure a wide range of biomarkers, uh, and test uh, interventions uh, ranging from lifestyle to small molecules or exercise. So just some things that are happening now uh, in these studies. We've nearly completed a cross-sectional study using really deep phenotyping of different biologic clocks in 450 Singaporeans. This is important because we have two ethnicities, Indian and Malay, about which we know very little with respect to aging. Uh, and we're already starting to see things that are different. So we need to be able to assess biologic age in populations in Singapore. 70% Chinese, but the rest of that is made up largely of Indian and Malay, and we need more information. We've also are just putting together a paper with the National Precision Medicine team to measure DNA methylation and aging markers in 10,000 Singaporeans. Uh, I can't show you that data yet, but I will be able to soon. There's some very interesting results there. Uh, first of all, um, not all ethnicities are aging at the same rate. Uh, probably because of lifestyle, uh, so that's interesting. Um, also, we've done GWAS and EWAS uh, looking at these uh, data sets, and we can find new genes and new methylation sites that are linked to aging, and we're trying to put functional meaning around that now. Uh, the human intervention studies are going AKGs first, probably rapamycin second. Uh, we're doing ethics on that now, and we're looking for more candidates, so get in touch. Uh, and we have a range of collaborative studies. One of the, just to give you an idea, you know, we're working with surgery department to try to see if biologic age is a predictor of surgical response in elderly populations, things like that. Um, we also have a, a BIA ECHO funded Asian Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. Uh, this has uh, been going for about a year now. We're already starting to publish papers. We have a great team of investigators. Ovarian aging is extremely important and underrepresented in research, so uh, we're interested in, a, in a better, getting a better grasp on this, partly to uh, understand female postmenopausal aging, but also to extend the period of fertility and give women more choices as they uh, proceed early in their families and careers. And then finally, we have a webinar uh, that we do three times a month, Thursdays at 7. You're welcome to sign up for it. Uh, you just go to NUS Healthy Longevity and search my name, and you'll find the webinar, and you can register. All the shows are on YouTube after the fact, 
Uh, so you can now go for free and see about 70 different shows on aging. Uh, we bring together clinicians, scientists, um, investors, interested public, and we try to want to create a platform where everybody can understand where the longevity field is going. Uh, so uh, we'll be continuing to do that show next year. Uh, and if you're interested, like I said, it's all free. So you can go sign up and watch the shows. So with that, I want to just stop. I, I talked a lot about the alpha ketoglutarate. That was a collaboration with Gordon Lithgow uh, at the Buck Institute uh, to start with. And now we've done a lot more work on that in labs here in Singapore. Uh, and um, a lot of what we're doing in humans is collaboration with Andrea Meyer, who's shown in the picture on the right. Uh, please um, ask any question you like, and I'll do my best to try to answer it. And thanks for inviting me. 谢谢Kennedy教授的分享,现场的观众朋友 Thank you very much for your sharing. Do we have any questions? Hello, Professor Kennedy. I remember that uh, you said before we would like to make everyone, not only the millionaires, to live longer. So for the uh, everyone, for common people, it's a matter is uh, money. So what do you think the anti-aging therapy and the drugs currently studied and studied may be as cheap, as easy to obtain as metformin in the future? You know, supplements are not all supplements are cheap, but many of them are relatively cheap and they can be made cheaper. Um, drugs like metformin, uh, uh, repurposing drugs, beta blockers are mentioned in the video. All of these things show promise with age and they're off patent. So as we do things at NUS, we're really trying to focus on those kinds of molecules that we can scale rapidly. Um, we obviously, we work with drug development companies and look at new, mo new molecules as well. Uh, but for, I think one of the most important things is if we can validate something that's relatively cheap uh, and extend it into the community, maybe using Singapore as a test bed or even China, uh, I think that uh, that would really have a huge impact on the longevity field because it would show that something's actually working, even if the effects are only very modest. So uh, metformin is a good candidate as well. We haven't started testing it yet, but um, you know, it's certainly something we could look at as well. I, I, but I, I agree with you. Um, it's not about billionaires, it's about billions and of people. And I think that we need to develop interventions that are cost effective. Thank you so much. So do we have more questions? The man in black. So I heard you mentioned many times before that some small molecule combinations cannot work together well in the mouse model. So I want to know that which small molecule combinations cannot play a synergistic role? Well, first of all, I think we've looked at about 12 to 15 combinations now in mice, and I'd say that um, maybe three or four of them at work additively together. Uh, several of them have no impact on each other. Uh, and then uh, there's some that cancel each other out. So for instance, I'll just give you one example. When we put NR in combination with AKG, they block each other's effect and we don't see a beneficial effect at all in mice. And I think that this is important to point out because we really need to understand uh, what, how these combinations work. And there are lots of people out there that are hacking, you know, taking all kinds of different supplements together. And I can't predict what, what's happening in their body because uh, we don't, I can't even predict what's going to happen with a new combination in mice right now. So uh, it, I, tell, I tell people that if you want to be an early adopter in this space, pick one or two at most things that you think might be beneficial that are safe. Uh, but don't mix 12 things together because we just don't know where that's going at this point. We're starting to look at a deeper analysis to, of mechanistic aspects of the molecules to begin to see if we can begin to predict how combinations might go together. I mean, one example is the TOR pathway. 
Uh, rapamycin directly affects the TOR pathway, but many of these other interventions are reported to indirectly affect mTOR signaling. So if you have uh, something that turns TOR down, two different molecules that turn TOR down by different mechanisms, it's possible that you're going to turn the pathway down too much, uh, and that's going to be detrimental because you do need TOR signaling at certain times. So I think that... Um, we need we need to do a lot more research to try to figure out what combinations are going to work well together. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. So, who is likely to get the next question? Hi, I heard you mentioned in your speech before that you don't mind cooperation with scholars and enterprises to promote some substances and therapies that you think have anti-aging potential. At present, China attaches great importance to aging research, and some enterprises have begun to join us in this field. So I wonder if you plan to cooperate with Chinese scholars and enterprises to carry out research in the future? Yeah, I mean, I had a lab in China for a while, many years ago, uh, as a second lab. So I was coming to China quite a lot, and I have many collaborators still there. So Jackie Han at Peking University is an example. We published several papers with her. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I want to do as much collaboration with China as possible. Happy to come visit uh, and try to set those collaborations up. It's been a little challenging <laughs> to, to travel at the moment, but when that picks back up, I think that uh, anything we can do to work together um, can only benefit both countries. Singapore is 70% Chinese, so it's, it's mostly the same eth ethnicity even. And, and both countries are very focused on healthy aging now. So uh, cooperation, I think, can only be beneficial. Thank you, Professor. And from the floor, we have like more eager participants, eager audience who would like to ask questions, so we only have a last chance. The woman in purple. I do not hear her. Please use a microphone. Hi, Professor Kennedy. I'd like to ask that, as we know, uh, one of the characteristics of the center is that it's the first time to carry out clinical research based on longevity medicine or geriatrics among Southeast Asian people. Are there any significant differences between Southeast Asians and other races in terms of longevity, drugs, or therapies? Are there significant differences? Yeah, I think the answer is going to be yes. Uh, we, we already see that, for instance, some population age at a different rate in Singapore than others uh, in terms of ethnicity. Um, so we, we also see genetic determinants linked to aging uh, in, that are different between Chinese, Malay, and, and Indian. So uh, it's clear that there are differences with respect to aging. There's also big lifestyle differences among these three ethnicities, particularly in terms of diet here in Singapore. So. Uh, Ultimately, we are going to have to figure out which kinds of interventions work best in which populations. Uh, and I think that's why it's so critical to have research going on in East Asia and Southeast Asia to try to understand that because uh, much of the research in the West is focused on Caucasians and Caucasian lifestyle, whereas things are quite a bit different here. So there will be things in common for sure. Uh, in fact, probably more in common than different, but there will be unique features of aging in each ethnicity and we need to understand those. Thank you for your answering and support, Professor Kennedy. We really benefit a lot from that.